All right, well, just a few concluding comments. I know you've been sitting for a while, but um, I just uh, have to thank all of the panelists and all the moderators uh, uh, for their really thoughtful presentations. We encourage them in our preparatory calls to be provocative, to share their stories, um, and to be open uh, to the questions that might come. And I think that they all met that standard and exceeded it. I learned so much. I have to say that this was actually pretty surreal for me. Maybe my, my team here could see the method to the madness, but. What you saw in these four panels at some level is reflective of um, the, the calls I get on a daily basis at, at some level. I get calls um, from, from um, folks who are pursuing their doctorates in science, feeling isolated and wanting to connect with a broader network and, and struggling with deep questions about should I be pursuing this or wow, I'm really interested in this. I'm not sure how my family's gonna feel or how do I talk to my family about this? So we wanted to give some, you know, some, some credence to that. We also get conversations conversations from tribal leaders and from communities struggling with this very issue of blood quantum and enrollment and whether or not science uh, and the ways that genetics research is, is progressing can be a help or a hurt in that conversation. I'm often, again, I know I've been talking about my DeLorean all day, but he has a chapter in his book, Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto called The Red and the Black, that I often come back to in this conversation about blood. And he asks the question, he talks about African Americans experience with the federal government and Native Americans experience the red and the black, the black and the red. Um, and he says, he asks the question, why um, forced exclusion for one? And why forced inclusion or assimilation for the other? He also holds up this notion of blood. Why one drop rule, right? If you only have one drop of, of black blood, of African American blood, you're black in this country historically and, and today. And yet for us as Native people, we have to prove our levels of blood. And his answer to both of those questions is one group had land. And so you have to forcibly include in order to break the bonds of kinship and relationality to place in order to allow that um, colonialization and occupation to happen. I would argue that uh, the other group had labor. Um, so we have to think about the relationship between the African American experience and the Native American experience. But just just you know, a few things going forward. I think um, we, we really want to say to you, this is 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 not the first of, of these conversations. This has been an ongoing conversation for communities, for agencies, uh, for students, uh, for teachers to, to be thinking about these questions for us as human beings in this in this conversation. And we look forward to continuing this. And just a few reflective points. I think one of the things I heard strongly today is is that there's a, a pretty strong narrative out there, and some might even call it a myth, that Native people don't want to participate in science. I'm not going to say genetics and genomics, but in science. And I think what you heard in a lot of these um, in these conversations is that there is a genuine desire to learn, to use science if it's done in a meaningful way, but that there's a need for increased transparency and um, understanding of how data is being used. And it's not just in the context of control. And a lot of the work that we do at NCI in community-based participatory research, there is this mythic of the gatekeeper. Tribal council is being framed as keeping researchers out, creating researcher burden. And we try to flip that on its head to say governance and sovereignty it is about control, but control to a particular end. It's about stewardship. It's about responsibility for decision making. And with that comes a particular ethic. So in all of these conversations, I'm always brought back to that, that conversation about ethics and, and the fact that, as, as you know, I, I suggested earlier, it's not a one moment decision. It's something we have to return to over and over again. But really, for me, ethics is about what are those boundaries? What are those limits? How do we, what are our anchor points when it comes to decision making? When we come across a new terrain that we haven't come across before, our community hasn't come across, what do we look to when it comes to making those decisions? How do we guide our decision making? What are those principles and those values? I uh, appreciate our, our Kanaka Maoli, our Native Hawaiian uh, uh, visitors and, and participants. One of the things I've learned from Native Hawaiian uh, kind of, uh, language is the idea that often in, in Western culture we think about looking forward into the future um, and the past is behind us. But what I've learned a little bit about uh, Native Hawaiian language and orientation is that all we can actually see is the past and the present that we're in. So we're actually 
facing our past, and we don't know what's coming in the future. We don't know what that looks like. And so I appreciated the comments about fear, but that idea of the unknown, I think, is something that we need to continue to be thinking about and work with each other to, to raise these difficult questions, to be willing to enter into these conversations, to not let fear bind us, um, but to move forward into that space. And I think that's particularly important because, as I told our membership when we gathered up in Anchorage last week for our mid-year conference, there are a lot of national and international conversations that require us to continue to engage in these discussions. A lot of the work um, led by NIH and HGRI to map the human genome is now informing work to map the human brain. There's a real big policy emphasis nationally about brain science. We have a huge aging population. Alzheimer's is at a, at a high rate for many of us. This is important. This is something that veterans, also returning um, service people, need to be uh, are, are participating in at some level. But what does that mean for how some of the conversations and discussions that you heard today about biobanking and sample collection and impact and benefit back on communities? So this conversation about genetics, I think, is, is a part of a broader one. Metadata. Uh, President Obama and his research and development strategy is promoting a metadata BD2K, uh, Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, where you're seeing these massive databases. You heard about a, a pretty amazing uh, Alaska Area Specimens Bank approach with protocol, with oversight, with stewardship in place there. But how are Native people um, engaging with these conversations? What does that look like? Recently hearing about citizen science coming up on the NIH agenda, thinking about how um, US citizens are talking about donating their uh, biological materials and the, the story around what that looks like. Are Native people being included? Uh, do we want to be included in some of that? What does that look like um, uh, at some level? So those are the conversations you know, that we hear about on a, on a daily basis at NCI. We get, you know, we get called from students. We get calls from federal agencies. We get calls from Native people who are concerned. We get calls from tribal leaders who say, I, I, I think this could have benefit for our communities, but who, who can I connect with? Who can I talk with? And that's, again, part of our role as, as a forum. And, I, and I'm here to tell you that uh, my boss, Janet Johnson Peta, the executive director, was here with us this morning. And you know, I was furiously getting a lot of text um, to say, you know, we need to sit down and, and, and relook at our policy agenda based on the conversations that she uh, even heard just this morning in terms of some of the NAGRA pieces and uh, NAGPRA, some of the data sharing pieces. So just is all to say that please be in conversation with us. When you have concerns or ideas, please let us know. If we don't respond the first time, send it again. Um, you know, we do want to be in conversation and want to understand how we can help. Uh, a couple of the pieces that um, we are moving forward as an organization that come and that touch on this trust question that I think kept coming up today. You know, uh, Abigail and Ron kept referencing this survey about uh, if the federal government is in control, there might not be that much trust given the history. Um, but some of the things we're trying to do in partnership with some of the people in this room with our federal agencies, um, create a national tribal roundtable. We have a curriculum that we put out at NCI around research regulation that helps guide tribal leaders in being in the driver's seat when it comes to research. What is, a, how do you design a research study? How do you have a conversation with a researcher about your cultural values? What does that look like? We do that over two and a half days, and it's a great experience on site. Um, but we've heard from a lot of tribes who've participated in that, OK, what's next? We want more. We want to talk to other tribes about how they're setting policy um, and what that looks like and how we can learn from each other. And so even in response to, I think, Phyllis's question earlier this morning about enforcement, one of the things that we talk to tribes about is how is the importance of building into your research codes, if you have them, or policies, actual cases or examples of decisions that your community has made in relation to a research question. That helps with sustainability, um, but it also helps to, to define and articulate how you see the role of the tribe and the responsibility in that decision making carried forward. So that's one of the things we're continuing to try to see. I know, you know our partners at University of Washington uh, have been leading that, certainly in their region, and we want to think about that on a national level. We also have a new project on youth ethics. We get a lot of calls from tribal leaders, from parents, uh, from students, um, that uh, educational settings are seen as places where there may be a little less oversight uh, and research regulation because they're about education, um, but concerned about the huge uh, national policy emphasis on um, tribal children. So there's 
There's a DOJ task force uh, Ron Whitener sits on, on violence against American Indian Alaska Native uh, children. Their report should be coming out within the year. Uh, Heidi ha Senator Heidi Heidkamp has a commission on a Native youth, so we know there's a huge focus on our kids. How can we as researchers engage that conversation, uh, particularly when it comes to genetics, uh, research, genetic research that uh, looks at diseases that have a particular Im uh, impact on our kids? Leukemia, huge spike in rates in the Southwest, looking at pharmacogenomics um, to, is, is that a, a piece that we should be investing in when it comes to addressing and, and assisting our kids and families who are struggling with that particular illness? Our genetics resource center, uh, you heard throughout the day, is online. Uh, we do have a few t-shirts uh, that the Sarahs have uh, in between them here. For those of you who've been tweeting, just give us a little wave and we can hand out a few of those. Or those of you who are pursuing those studies that we need you to keep, keep going, we have a few of them to give out just to um, share a little bit about the Genetics Resource Center we worked with in partnership with NHGRI to give information about um, how uh, tribal leaders were requesting, how can we start thinking about these decisions. So this is, we don't take a position, but we provide information with a lot of the people that you see here in the office as some of the collaborating authors. And finally, I think our work at NCI, where we believe that tribes have sovereignty over research um, that happens on their lands and with their citizens, that includes urban populations, as you heard Abigail mention, is to promote this two-sided coin, that in the work that we do, in the ethics that we do, there, there's one side, which is protection. We have to protect our people. We have to protect our cultures. And there are various ways that communities are going about that. Some of them have issued moratoriums. Others of them have issued uh, collaborative research relationship partnerships with uh, genetics researchers and others. The other side of that protect coin is benefit, and you heard that consistently through the day. How we as, as researchers, as scientists, as community members are articulating what is the benefit to our people, to what end. This notion of science for science's sake doesn't often appeal to our communities. So how can we articulate that benefit and make sure that the investments we're calling on the federal government to make, our communities to make, really do have um, that powerful end there. I want to just end by telling you a story that I heard recently. I went down to uh, Tuskegee University, has a bioethics symposium uh, every year uh, where some of you may know about the uh, Tuskegee syphilis study, another study where ethics were very much violated. African American men um, uh, were uh, given were uh, given the syphilis uh, virus um, in order to study the impacts on the body without their consent, without their knowledge. So as part of Tuskegee's role and responsibility, they bring in people to talk about the impact impacts on these, these men and their families and their communities. You go and visit the school and the church uh, where the men were, um, the, their, uh, the, a nurse came to visit and check up on them um, throughout the study. Um, but it was powerful because I heard a presentation there about a, a teacher, uh, instructor, faculty member, um, and she was engaging with a large African American population about the Tuskegee study, it was ethics course. And they ended up talking about the Henrietta Lacks case, a name that many of you who do work in, in research and ethics if you haven't heard of Henrietta Lacks, Google it, um, read the book. It's a fascinating, important story about um, genetic science and consent and impact on uh, communities, in this case, African American, right here in this uh, Baltimore region. Um, at any rate, uh, the, the professor was talking to the, the students and said, you know, they went to see the Henrietta Lacks exhibit that had come to Tuskegee. And she overheard them saying, oh, you know, this is so wrong. And how could people do this? How could people take advantage? advantage of a, of a woman and not um, have her consent and essentially her um, a sample of, of her, uh, there was a cervical um, sample uh, cells were have been used to inform cancer research globally um, and continue to be a, a source of, of information. And so she overheard her students really just saying, I, that would never happen in this day and age. I would never do that. And so the next day in class, she had them come in. She said, I overheard some of the conversation, and yeah, they were fired up. And she said, well, let me ask you, how many of you are doing um, stem cell research? Tuskegee is a big site for this. Pretty much all of them raised their hand. They were all seniors. And she said, OK, um, so uh, how many of you have actually gone back to look for the consent documents for the samples that you work with on a daily basis? Not a one. And she said, and how many of you would, um, if it, is, it was about two weeks before graduation, if your supervisor came in and asked you, um, 
you know, that you needed to do one more, uh, one more run, one more analysis of the sample, but they hadn't quite gotten the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, uh, approval, but it was all right. You could go ahead and, and, and make it happen. How many of you would do that if you believe that it was, uh, you know, would impact your graduation, your, your completion? To a person, they all raise their hand saying that they would. And so her point and what I took from that is that um, even those of us who are daily engaging with these conversations about ethics, it's a very um, hard, uh, difficult path uh, to, to hold ourselves accountable in this. And her, her talk was called, Who's Watching the Watchers? She was talking about herself as a faculty member and how was she, you know, how would she, could she hold her, her students accountable, but who is holding her accountable at the same level? And, and, and my answer and my thinking about that is it's community. It's the fact that we continue to have these dialogues, to ask each other the difficult questions, to own up to responsibilities that we may have shirked on, and to try to do better every day. That is our work here to protect and to benefit our people in the use and advancement of science in this. So I want to thank you for spending the day with us, and uh, I just hope that we continue to engage in this important conversation and those that, that are connected. We have a um, reception following. We have some taxis that have been ordered in the front of the museum. Uh, it's technically starting at 6. I've asked them to be ready at 5.45 at the embassy. You all are welcome. The Embassy of Tribal Nations is at 15th and P Street Northwest, 1516 P Street Northwest. We'll just have some, uh, some more d'oeuvres and things if you want to continue to connect. But I want to thank you all, thank the museum, thank our partners at the National Human Genome Research, and Research Institute, and all of you who have joined us um, from so very far away, and all of you on the live stream as well. So thank you, Kayana, and I uh, look forward to seeing you at the reception.